One quick question to start with. Um, hands up if you're running Docker in production. Do you want to give this talk? <laughs> <laughs> right, so my name's Simon. I work at Pearson. Um, hands up if you don't know who Pearson is. Okay, cool. I'll do a little two-second introduction to Pearson. Pearson's a publisher. They, um, they publish um, textbooks, lots and lots of textbooks. They also own the Financial Times, and uh, they're moving uh, into sort of educational app territory, um, and they're very, very big. So this is the story of Docker at Pearson so far. Um, we're somewhere between step one and step two, um, as I think probably everybody is, except those of you who've already moved into production. But you know we're really interested in Docker um, and containerization as a thing, um, and I'll, I'll go through a little bit why. So Pearson, as I said, is a really big company, and it's made up of many integrated businesses. Like most large enterprises, it's formed from many mergers and acquisitions. And with that, it means we've inherited basically all of the stacks. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the team that I'm in, we deal with like all of these different platform stacks, like literally every day. Um, and we use uh, lots of different clouds as well. Like these are just some of the ones that we're using now. Um, and with all of those different technology stacks and all those different business units and all those different businesses, we've basically inherited all the different tool sets as well. We still have uh, we still have some applications that are at a stage of like developers sending us zip files and Word documents, but we're definitely moving uh, moving in the right direction there. Um, and we have basically all the operating systems. Um, what's the last one called? Win Win something? Um, can't remember. Yeah, something like that. And it's an ongoing problem. Um, we're adding technologies faster than we're converging them, definitely. Um, and the thing with large enterprises is, by the time you standardize on something, it's obsolete. Like, we're trying, we're pushing really, really hard right now to standardize on Chef 10. <laughs> I thought that joke would get a laugh from, like, the Chef people, and the puppet people would be like, what? <laughs> Glad I was right. So how did we get here, right? So um, the combinatorial explosion of technologies and stacks and clouds really comes from... Um, the availability of infrastructure as a service. So a few years ago, when when business units realised they could, you know, um, you know, they want they would they want to build this new application. They don't want restrictions to their technology. So what do they do? They go and ask for cloud. They just ask for some cloud infrastructure. They get their you know credit card out and they go to their uh, product owner and they go like, we don't need to talk to hosting. We don't need to talk to operations. We can just go to Amazon and get some servers and install whatever we want on it. And then when the developers are finished, they sort of hand over this project and it's like completely different to everyone else, right? So this, is, this brings up the kind of the, the root of DevOps is this tension between developers and operations people. And what do devs want? Devs want their choice of technology um, and they want to get not, not to get woken up in the middle of the night. And what do ops people want? They want their choice of technology primarily so they know what to do in the middle of the night, right? So I'm going to ask you guys another question. Hands up here if you consider yourself the ops half of DevOps. And the dev half? Yeah, so it's literally split right down the middle, which I love to see. I'm really happy about that. It means the whole DevOps thing is still working. <laughs> um, it'd be horrible to come here and, and dev people just going like, ops people don't need them. Um, so Docker to the rescue, right? So um, if this pans out, if containerization pans out, like the whole promise is that you should be able to take uh, applications and just standardize on the deployment method, right? Like the way you deploy a Docker app, no matter a Docker container, no matter what's inside it, should be the same. I'm not sure what it's going to be yet, but it'll be the same, right? And the way you roll back should actually be pretty simple because the old container should still be there. And this is this is something I want to talk about. The convergence when you're building a, a Dockerized app, convergence happens not at deploy time. So I'll talk about what convergence is. Convergence is that um, magical moment when the machine that you're upgrading and all of its previous history and all of its beautiful and uniqueness and its snowflakeness somehow has to cope with this hopefully item potent new upgrade script that's going to like install itself on that machine and hopefully it's going to work and remember it's four o'clock in the morning and the ops guy is really really tired and um, the nice thing about dockerized applications is hopefully that doesn't happen at four o'clock in the morning hopefully that convergence like the merging of your item potent recipes together to produce the application that you want to run in production hopefully that should happen sort of before you get anywhere near the deployment. So that's going to be a good thing as well. So what are we doing, right? Um, baby steps for us. Um, Docker's not ready for production. Like, they didn't drop Docker 1.0 today, did they? Did they? Seriously? 
I was really worried they would, and then my slide would be out of date, right? So Docker's not ready for production. It does work except when it doesn't, like 0.7.3, when they change the, uh, the back end. Um, but the main reason not to deploy Docker into production right now is that the tooling and the API around it is just changing too fast, right? The command lines uh, options are changing too fast. What you can do with it is changing too fast. The default parameters are changing too fast. And all of the things, like all of the chef recipes around it, the puppet manic, like everything is just changing too fast to really um, to put it anywhere near production. Or you're just going to be incurring technical debt as everybody else moves on to something else. So what we decided to do instead is we'd use it for our build processes. So these are things that are not directly connected um, to the production, but they're things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a good way for us to get a, a real grip on what Docker is and how it works and to get a good feel for it. And it's paid off pretty well. Um, so our first plan was to move Jenkins into Docker. This did not go well. Um, <laughs> but we learned a lot. Um, I naively thought that, you know, I mean, you guys, hands up who knows Jenkins? Hands up who has a love-hate relationship with Jenkins? Yeah, so those of you who don't know Jenkins, it's horrible. It's just this weird, Jenkins like doesn't use a database, it just writes like a million XML files, um, and it leaks memory and process handles and things that you didn't even know Unix had, and you know, it just logs in everywhere, and um, it didn't go well, but I did learn a lot about um, what kind of applications do and don't go well in, inside a Docker container, and I'll get to that in a second. The next thing I moved into Docker containers was RPM creation. And honestly, I can't remember how I used to do DevOps before Docker, and it's only been nine months. Um, so we, we um, build a lot of RPMs. We use spec files a lot, um, but we also use Omnibus and uh, Jordan Cecil's Fine Package Manager. Um, not its real name. Um, so the, the normal way of building an RPM file is you have to build it on a target architecture, which means you normally need to have uh, a vagrant machine and you vagrant up every time you want to build an RPM, but then you kind of get lazy and you don't bother destroying the vagrant box, you just sort of reuse it. And that's kind of dangerous because a, a vagrant build um, machine that has been used previously might have things installed on it that came from a previous installation, right? So the proper thing to do would be to destroy your vagrant box and start again and, and rebuild every time, but nobody does because it's really slow. So Doc has been really fantastic for that because it's really, really fast. So now I can, I can build my RPMs completely cleanly and it, it's as fast as building a native box. Whereas if I was to do the vagrant box properly, I'd have to like destroy it and recreate it each time and there's a, a few minute overhead. So that's a really cool thing um, to, do with, uh, to do with Docker. And as a generic replacement for virtual end of an RB env, when I start a project now, like I used to, I'm a Python person, I've got no gripe with any Ruby people, um, but I used to like go into a directory and type virtual env dot, right? Like virtual env init dot, every single time. Um, and now I don't. Now I basically, whenever I start a new, a new process or build a new script or something that I think I'm gonna have to install some, uh, some uh, you know, pip modules or, or Ruby gems, um, I start with a Docker container and I work inside that. And um, that's been really, like, for me, especially because I, I use uh, both Python and Ruby a lot, like I'll do tools that use a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of bash around the front of it. And um, That's been really good. So as a generic uh, replacement for virtual env and RBN, Docker's been completely invaluable and I can't remember how I, I used to work without it. So the next thing for us is, after that, was we looked, um, we're looking toward moving our low risk services um, into, into Docker containers. These are things like our RESTful services. So at Pearson we've got this kind of, not a rule I guess, but like a plan that um, as DevOps tools developers, like you, you're knocking out shell scripts all the time. Like, you know, little tools, like they're not quite one-off tools, but you might use them a few times. Um, and they become quite useful and then suddenly you're supporting them and, and uh, you've got to come up with a good name for them um, or they end up being called Simon's tool. Um, so we, we call that, we have these things like the RESTful X services. So we have the, the RESTful RPM receiving service, the RESTful chef config receiving service, the RESTful just fucking do it service, which is my favorite one. Um, and they're, they're um, written in a combination of, you know, Bash, um, Grape, uh, which is Ruby, and uh, Flask, which is Python. So moving those into Docker containers has been really good because it means we can relocate them to different cloud providers. Like we might host the same application, uh, just move it between RightScale and uh, vCloud or, or uh, Datapipe or, or whatever. So that's, um, that's the second thing that we've done with Docker. So post 1.0, this is what we're, what we're planning on right now. And I've just um, been working with the team in the States for the last couple of weeks to come up with our sort of our roadmap for our platform as a service um, that we're going to build. Um, and Docker's going to be a, a deploy target, like an absolute valid deploy target. 
So instead of telling the developers, like we, we definitely don't want to tell the developers that they can give us a zip file in a Word document anymore. Um, for a, about a year and a half now, we've been pretty good at telling them that the only way they can give us an application is in an RPM file or in a, uh, a WAR file. Um, but we want to we want to support dev files and, uh, and other things as well. But we also want to make Docker containers like the absolute default choice for developers. So if you're a developer and you're building an application, um, we want you to give us a Docker container um, instead of uh, one of these other things. Um, but that means we're going to have to start looking at building the supporting infrastructure because Docker by itself is not a magic bullet. Um, so these are some of the things I've been investigating uh, as well. But I'll get onto those in a second. So another quick little aside, and there's a few in this talk, um, is host networking. Who's played with host networking so far? Right, so that's good. I thought I'd include it because it's really new. Um, Docker, when it, when it runs, it used to mean that each container would get its own IP address, and you would expose the services in that container by doing port forwarding, right? Um, and I think, so now Docker has this new feature where the Docker container can just bind to the host's uh, IP address, to the host's network interface and the services are directly exposed, right? Um, and I wish Docker had had that from the beginning because one of the mistakes that I made, and I think a lot of people have made, is to think of Docker as a sort of super lightweight uh, virtualization technology. And people got this mindset in their heads that like Docker's just like VMware or, or KVM or, or VirtualBox, but really, really fast. And that led to a lot of mistakes, um, certainly um, on my behalf. So now that Docker has host networking, it makes a lot more sense if we think about Docker as a sort of a generic uh, virtual env or RBN. It's a combination of a really good package manager with a really good dependency isolation system like virtual env. Um, so and this is the other little aside. This is why our, uh, our Jenkins F didn't go well. So who's familiar with this base image? Cool, okay. So your Docker container is probably broken. And every single Docker container that I had produced was broken. Um, so when you run an application inside Docker, it's the only thing that's running. Now, in a Unix operating system, normally there's supposed to be a process called a NIT, which is, which is PID 0. And it's the process that starts everything else. Like it starts the shell, and then the shell starts the whatever, right? But a NIT has some special, um, some special uh, requirements. It has to clean up zombie PIDs and close file handles if they, if they don't get closed. And it has a whole bunch of things it's supposed to do. And if you're just running an application inside a Docker container and you're not running an init-like process, it's gathering entropy over time. So there's two, there's two kinds of applications you can run inside a Docker container. There's these sort of short-lived um, boot them up, use them, destroy them, like tools. Um, there's, uh, t there's applications which are long running, but they're immutable. They don't write anything to the disk. and if anything goes wrong with them, you kill them. And in fact, you kill them every hour anyway and restart them and add them back into the load balance pool. They're fine. And then there's applications which are beautiful, unique snowflakes. Things like Jira, things like uh, Jenkins. Um, those sort of applications that you really, like the kind of things you used to target to a full virtual machine. And for those things, you've got to be really, really careful that you don't just run that application in a Docker container and expect it to work because it won't. Uh, especially if you, don't, uh, if you don't base your Docker container on something that has a pseudo init process, something that will go on and actually clean up after, after the process that's running inside it. So that's a word of warning. Um, these people explain it a lot better than I can. Um, so go Google um, base image Docker and read that, um, read that uh, blog post um, that your, your Docker container is probably broken. So um, Jenkins didn't work inside Docker for that exact reason. And because um, I naively had hoped that we could containerize the beautiful, unique snowflakeless, snowflakeness of Jenkins. That's pretty hard to say. Um, so it got me thinking, what kind of applications do fit into uh, inside Docker containers? And it, wouldn't it be cool if there was a, a website that would uh, tell you um, what kind of applications fit nicely inside Docker containers? Um, this is a, a site called 12factor.net, which is written by the co-founder of Heroku. And it describes the, the 12 um, principles of application architecture that will make your application scale to web scale. Um, in, uh, in, and, and work on the Heroku platform. Um, and they took their, their branding and their logo off it completely, and they put it up as a generic guide to how to build applications that will scale and work in the cloud. And it turns out to be a completely perfect description of applications that will fit inside a Docker container. So if you're doing DevOps and you're reaching out to development teams like we are, and you're telling them that they should be thinking about building their application in such a way that it can fit inside a container, then you should point them at this website, um, 12factor.net, and try to get them to, uh, to assess their application against these principles. 
So um, DevOps is a social movement, and I'd like to propose a social contract that's coming um, as a result of containerization. Um, if you're an ops person, you should be able to say that if you can make your application run in a Docker container, we can host it. And if you're a devs person, a dev person, you should be able to say that we need to ensure our applications can be containerized. And that seems to be like a nice, clean interface between the devy type people, the devy type DevOps people, and the opsy type op DevOps people. If that makes any sense. So there's a lot of great opportunities. Like we wouldn't, like we wouldn't be, you know, throwing out years and years of N-tier architecture and well understood, you know, systems administration process if there wasn't something good coming out of containerization. And these are the ones that I'm most excited about. Um, zero downtime releasing. If your application is containerized, um, you can have the old version of the application and the new version of the application installed on the same Docker host, on the same compute resources, um, side by side because it has complete perfect dependency isolation. And then the, the upgrade or release process is simply a matter of draining the connections from one application and moving them over to another application or something similar to that. Um, doesn't fix DB schema problems, nothing does. Um, <laughs> I used to work for Basho. I did a talk at DevOps Days about, about two years ago about uh, how to, the only way to fix schema problems was to not use a database schema. Did anyone see it? <laughs> yeah. I still believe it, but I don't work at Basho anymore. So now I can say I don't think anything fixes it. Um, so the other opportunity is to deploy widely instead of deeply. So we leverage auto-scaling, um, and it sucks. Um, when you auto-scale something, it takes sort of 30 minutes to boot a new machine. Um, and add it to the pool. And that's fine if you're auto-scaling from sort of 100 servers to 105 servers or whatever, right? But if, you're, if your application normally sits at one server and then at sort of 9 a.m. on the first day of school term when everybody tries to do enrollments, um, it suddenly needs 40 servers and you've set like a maximum scaling time, it's just not going to keep up. Like you're going to have a horrible experience if somebody didn't call you and warn you to boot more servers, right? So auto scaling's not great, but we have a lot of... Like Pearson has over 3,000 applications, and a lot of them are seasonal. Um, and if we could find some way of averaging our load over all of those applications, then we could use our compute resources much more efficiently. Um, so that's a great opportunity for us. And that's going to save us a lot of money. So back, uh, back in sort of 2000, 2001, the default uh, architecture for an application was N-tier architecture, and that N was usually three. And the three tiers were usually web server, middleware server, and database server. And people kind of got used to this idea, and it became the default assumption that for security reasons and dependency isolation, you would always have three servers, right, to keep those three things separately. And in production, you need two of everything, right? So that means six servers. And if you're going to have a pre-production environment that looks like your production, in, you know, production environment, that means 12 servers. So now you've got a dozen machines just to run one naughty little application that only gets run one day a year. And that's an extreme example, but I think that happens a lot more than you'd think. Um, and, and part of that is security isolation, but part of that is also dependency isolation. Um, and you're paying for virtual machines when you don't need to be. And you'll start to get emails like this. This is an actual email that we got the other day, but I had to censor the actual numerical value, I'm sorry. Um, but we have 3,000 applications, and this is one of our AWS accounts, and like 147 of the 160-odd machines are like less than 10% utilized. And that's because we're using virtual machines, Amazon virtual machines, for isolation. Um, and part of that is dependency isolation. So there's a great opportunity there for, docker for dockerizing and, and scaling over the uh, whole estate. So Docker's really, really fast. So fast that you can do this. Um, how, am I, how am I going for time? What am I up to? I wasn't even paying attention. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, cool. So one quick little aside. Docker's much faster than people think. Um, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the Emacs, Sublime, and TextMate people. They're the kind of people who usually come from a dev background, and they like to take the problem they're working on and pull it down onto their machine and work on it and fix it and then do a git push and push it back up again, right? And then there's the opsy type people who are the ones who sort of go to where the problem is. And they tend to favor VI because it's always available, right? So you sort of log on to the machine, you know, especially people who came from a sysadmin background. You log on to the machine, you go to where the problem is, and you use VI and you fix it, right? But it's really annoying because you haven't got all of your VMRC and your auto indents and your colorization and all your cool plugins and stuff. But Docker's so fast that if you take your Vim installation and move it into a Docker container, then you can basically do this. You can basically go to any machine and say vim is equal to this, docker run uh, interactive terminal, um, mount the current directory into that and, and run my vim setup. And, um, and you'll have like uh, vim 
with all of your plugins and everything else installed and still be, able on, be on a machine that may have only just booted or that you've never used before. Um, it's a cool little trick, but it underscores exactly how fast Docker actually is. Because the first time you've done it, it might take a second or two, especially if you base that image on BusyBox. But after that, it's, it's as quick as starting Vim. So it's a cool trick, and I just thought I'd put it in there because it's uh, kind of interesting. So mindset differences. Um, we're moving into the era of containerization, and I think it's going to be as big a change for our industry as virtualization was. Um, and here's some of the things that you should start to think about now. Um, immutable infrastructure um, is um, provisioning becomes less important. So having a, a really good um, provisioning system um, like Chef or Puppet with lots of branching and exception management strategies isn't so important when uh, that provisioning is happening inside a Docker container and is going from a known state to another known state um, with very little possibility of, of variation. Um, and containerized apps, there's some challenges as well. Centralized logging becomes so much more important. In fact, it becomes completely critical. Um, your application container, like the new default in Docker, is that when you shut down the application running inside a Docker container, unless you've told it to persist that, is to remove the container. Right? So you obviously can't write the logs inside the container anymore, and you shouldn't anyway, but you definitely can't write the logs inside the container. And if you've chosen to scale widely over 100 or 200 or 300 hosts, the chance of you actually being able to find the machine that's hosting that Docker container is very small as well. So centralized logging becomes like, completely critical if you want to build Docker at scale. Um, membership and service discovery is really important too. Um, we want to be moving to an era where, where things can scale up or scale down in like sort of a minute or, or 30 seconds. Um, and we don't, like, we're, we're stuck in this, in this state at Pearson where we're sort of slowly disentangling our provisioning system, which is Chef, from our service discovery and membership stuff. Um, you don't want to be using the Chef index or the Puppet DB to store load balancer um, members because, like, Chef's probably only running once every half hour. So what was the point in removing that 30-minute boot time or boot lag if you're still only going to run Chef every half hour? Um, there's things like Surf, which is made by the HashiCorp, um, the guys that brought you Packer and, uh, and um, Vagrant. Of course, yeah. Um, so Surf, Surf's kind of solving that problem for us. We're not re really ready to use it just yet, but at a lower level, there's things like, um, like Live Config can handle this problem for you as well. Um, etcd is sort of a, a backing store where you can store this configuration information at sort of temporary um, cache of like what um, servers live in what load balancer pool and where the current MySQL master is. And there's a, a tool called uh, Supervisor, Supervisor D, not Supervisor D, um, ConfD that monitors um, that database and will automatically um, reload and restart the process that requires those things. So you might have ConfD sort of watching etcd, which is um, contains the current membership pool of your load balancer, and then whenever confd notices a change, it quickly updates the, rebuilds the nginx config and reloads uh, nginx. So that's sort of a, a halfway house um, between, uh, between that and running something like surf. So the new paradigm um, that's coming, I think, is um, instead of infrastructure as a service, instead of going, instead of uh, business units going out and getting infrastructure and doing whatever they want with it, and this sort of combinatorial um, explosion, it's platform as a service instead, um, but with stack agnosticism, right? Not telling people they can't use Node.js because it's not been approved for use within the enterprise. If they want to use Node.js or, you know, Thin or some Ruby stuff or whatever the Go server is going to come, um, they're allowed to, you know? Like, the next big thing is the next thing. Um, and uh, scaling applications widely to, to take advantage of the more efficient utilization of resources. Um, an immutable and disposable infrastructure. Like, we eventually, I think we're going to get to a point where we do um, crash only infrastructure. So, who's anyone here program Erlang? A couple of people, right? So, Erlang's got this weird idea that, like, don't do any exception handling, right? Like, as soon as your Erlang application gets to a point where it's outside the bounds of normality, just crash and start a new one. And it means it makes for very fast, very um, bug free code. And it'd be nice if we could get to the same sort of point with, uh, like, imagine if you had. Uh, you know, sort of 10,000 application servers running. And the first time an application server generated a 500 error, you know, I think that's, that's the sort of the direction we're heading in. Um, commoditized operating systems. You can run a, a, a Red Hat container on an Ubuntu host or an Ubuntu host on a Red Hat container or CentOS or whatever you want. Like, it just doesn't really matter anymore um, what 
uh, what operating system you're running, they're all pretty much equivalent and, and uh, the only real differences between a, a Docker container based on Red Hat and a Docker container based on CentOS is the packaging system that you use to install the, uh, the dependencies. Um, so Docker's awesome. I think you all know that because that's why there's so many people here. Um, it is radically disruptive technology. Um, it's time to, to start reassessing like restricted technology stacks within enterprises. Um, it's time to, to reassess uh, convergent configuration systems. They were so much better than anything came, that came before, but I think that um, we're going to start moving toward immutable infrastructure and they'll become less important. Um, and the whole idea of reusing or upgrading machines should just go away, I think. So that's all I've got. Um, the last slide's about coming and working at Pearson. Um, if you're looking for a great place to do DevOps, um, yeah, we're hiring. Cheers.